we've got the Students' Guide to Lost Learning for November and December assessment. So I'm just going to talk you through how to use this guide. Um, there's an introduction at the beginning, and this really outlines that this has been put in place because of the ongoing um, uh, stre stresses and strains we've got through the COVID-19 pandemic and how learning's been interrupted. And there's different levels of lost learning that are happening um, across the globe. So um, our regulator, Ofqual, has, has given us some guidelines around this, and we are able to give you a little bit more guidance on areas to focus on um, for, for assessment windows. And the reason for that is mainly due to the fact that you may not have had much face-to-face -face contact time or remote delivery time as you would have had, and you may have had to do a lot more um, self-study during this period. So this guide is really to give you an idea of um, how you can how you can focus your, your um, research for your open book exams and your assignments. Um, one thing I do want to say though, it's advisable that you study the whole syllabus for the unit that you're taking an assessment in. So if you can study the whole syllabus, and then as you start to work through your assignment, you can use this guide to really pinpoint the individual assessment criteria that you're gonna need to expand on um, in a little bit more detail. So it clearly states there that this is just for this assessment window. Don't model this one up with the May, June one. Um, and you also need the relevant ABE um, syllabi unit resource um, and the study guide is useful as well for this. Okay, so you'll see that as we go through, it's in unit level order. There's only one level three unit. Um, and what you'll see here is it will list the question numbers, um, the syllabus criteria number, and then the individual assessment criteria. For level three, it's set out slightly differently to the other levels. And you'll see marks per question. Okay, so looking at this one, it's clear that question one has got 35 marks, so it's gonna require a bigger answer and, and more detail. And you can also see that more assessment criteria are covered with question one. So that's how you'll need to sort of focus your, your research um, looking at, at the breakdown of the marks allocated to each of the questions. So as I said, the level three unit is slightly different to the others. Um, it goes in order. We've got all of the level four units, then all of the level five, then all of the level six. So if we just take an example of a level four unit here, you'll see the question numbers are listed down the side. Um, each question will be in order of the learning outcomes. And then what we've done is we've broken down the specific assessment criteria that the question really relates to. Now for this question, there's 16 marks and the main focus is assessment criteria 1.4. Having said that, you do need to look at all of the assessment criteria in learning outcome one, because there might be some interrelated criteria that might get you larger, um, get you higher marks. So, so focus on 1.4, make sure you understand that, but look at the learning outcome as a whole as well. And, and really this guide just follows that format all the way through. It gives you an idea for each unit, the question numbers and the marks that are allocated to those question numbers. You'll see for some that they're broken down into an A and B. So three part A, three part B. And again, you'll see there, that the marks are split and they're split over different assessment criteria as well. So use this guide in conjunction um, with your assignment writing or your open book exam writing um, to, to give you a bit more of a guide as to really where to focus your reading. Um, that said, you do, if you want to hit the upper ends of the marks, assignment are going into a bit more detail um, further on in this session, you do need to do some wider reading and some wider research as well. But hopefully this will just give you a bit of reassurance um, if you're struggling um, with self-study, that, that it gives you a little bit more support around where the, the questions will be focused. Um, I'm just gonna briefly stop sharing and go back to, to the slides. Um, 
Simon, if you can confirm again for me that you can see these, that would be good. Otherwise, I'll be carrying on talking. And um, yes, I can see these. Perfect. Let's try and get the slide show up. If this little banner will disappear at the bottom for me. One moment. God, things in the way today. Here we go. Okay, okay, so we're back to the agenda. So we've looked at the student guide to lost learning time. And as I said before, the centre guidance document is very similar to this. Um, and, and it'll give um, centres an idea of how to support students. Exactly the same um, detail in there. Okay, so we've, we've covered that one off the lost learning time. Now we're going to go back to um, some basics. Uh, previously, we've, we've run sessions with our academic team um, and Carrie Foster, um, one of our academic team, has delivered a really, really nice long session around writing a great assignment, which can still be viewed on YouTube. Um, and there's links at the end of these slides to remind you of where that is. What we've done is we've taken some snippets from that and we're going to go through and give you a little bit of a reminder on how best to prepare um, for your up and coming assessments and, and some top tips around that. Okay, so first of all, with an assignment and an open book exam, there's always an organisational summary that's required. Um, so with the organisational summary, there's some key things that you can see on this slide that need to be included. So typical things like the name of the org, the size, the main markets they operate in, examples of what they do, so their products and services, etc. that you can see there. The key thing with it, though, is that you have a look at the questions first that are in your assessment. Um, and then if you look at the questions that are in the assignment or the open book exam, you can then decide what sort of organisation would best serve you answering those questions. For some questions, it would be better to have a larger organisation, maybe a more global organisation. For other questions, a local organisation um, would be good enough. Um, there are some, some units where an organisation that's maybe very small might not help you fully answer the questions in the detail required. So, so think about your organisational summary in relation to the questions that you're being asked in the unit and in relation to the particular unit. It could be you're doing two or three units and you pick an organisation and it actually works for all three. That's completely fine. There's no problem with that but do make sure you read the questions and make sure the organisation is relevant to answer those questions and give you a good chance of answering those questions. Now we say it needs to be about 200 words long, but it doesn't, it's not included in your word count. But we do need some detail about your organisational summary. Now, as you'll see right at the top, if you fail to include it, you will get a zero mark and that means you will fail the unit. Um, the reason for that is ABE's qualifications are designed to be um, applied. So although they're very, very knowledge based, what we want to do during the assessment is to be able to um, to be able to apply that knowledge. So we want to see that you're taking the knowledge um, and you're able to apply it. Let's see if I can mute. Okay, Simon or Linda, could I just ask you to have a look to see if you can mute everybody, please, because somebody's come in and they're not automatically muted as they should be, so I can continue doing the delivery. Um, okay, so a, a naught mark would suggest would would mean that you've you've actually failed the unit. So do make sure that you include that and and make sure you check that back for its relevance. Okay. One moment, sorry, a few technical hitches today, it would seem. Okay, somebody is still not on mute. Could I ask everybody to mute, please, if they've just come into the meeting? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move on to word count and appendices. 
Um, you'll see that we've circled here, um, and it's a snapshot of what a typical assignment or an open book exam would look like. Um, and it shows the it shows the word count. We've highlighted there that there's a 10% tolerance either way. So you can either do under the word count by 10% or over the word count by 10%. Any more than that, and the marker will stop marking. So you may feel that you want to write lots and lots and lots to show your knowledge. The, the key thing with open book um, exams and assignments is that you can write in a detailed and concise way. So we don't want lots and lots of words. We just want you to meet the word count in answering the questions. Um, references and appendices are not included. However, don't add lots and lots of appendices in and then in the main body of your text say, see appendix one, see appendix two, see appendix three, because the marker won't go through, that will only look at, at relevant references to appendices. And from next year onwards, we're gonna be stopping the use of appendices. So I would say for this window, if you can do without appendices, um, just reference things in directly in the text if they're relevant to answering the question rather than adding in lots and lots and lots of appendices that, that really aren't referenced correctly or relevant to the answer of the question. So the key thing is you stick, you stick to the word count and that you answer the questions that are in front of you. Um, in terms of allocation of word count, you'll be able to see this by the marks that are given for each question. So as the example shows there, if it's a 10 mark question, then you'll know how that, that you only use 10 marks worthy worth of words. For the open book exams, we do give you a word count as a guide. Um, for the assignments, there's task one to four normally, and we don't give you a word count breakdown across those tasks. So for the assignments, have a look at the marks that are allocated and then work out your percentage word count in accordance to those marks that are allocated. The more marks the task gives, the more words that you can give for that task. Um, the other pointer is if you can start by um, typing your assignments or your open book exams in Word, you can then use the word count function. Um, and then when you're happy that you've got your final submission, you can save it as a PDF and then submit it. And you'll know that you've checked those words. Um, our markers will stop marking if something goes over the word count. Um, and generally speaking on, on sort of 12 font, 10 or 12 font, they have a good idea of how many pages that is. So um, don't feel that because it's a PDF, that you can just keep writing and writing and the markers will mark it, they'll stop marking. And that could be the difference between a pass and a refer. So take real good note of, of your word count and the marks that are allocated for each question. Okay, this may sound really obvious, this next point, but you need to read the question and follow the instructions. Um, there's command words at the beginning of every question. So it could say, explain X and Y. It could ask you to describe something. It could ask you to evaluate something. Um, as you get up through the levels, sort of five and six, you might see things like critically analyze or critically assess. Um, and so you need to take note of that command word that's given at the beginning of the question, because that'll indicate how you answer the question. Um, so what you need to really avoid, and a, a slide further on will we'll talk about this, is just taking all the theory that you know and dumping it in the answer of your question. You need to structure your question and you need to follow the instructions that are in the, in the questions. So, so it's really important you look at the command words at the beginning and respond and answer to that. Um, also, there's another example. In some questions, it asks you to talk about your skills in relation to something. So a lot of the HR based units will talk about, you know, what skills do you bring to your organisation? And so you need to then talk about your skills and not just skills in general that would be good um, uh, for that particular job role. Um, some things do require um, slides to be um, 
to be added with them or project plans. And so just make sure you read the instructions. If it says eight slides, don't deliver 12 or 14 or five, deliver no more than eight slides. Okay, and, and just stay within the framework because you don't get marked for things that you're not asked for. So you might think, oh, this could relate to the question and I'll add this, these 20 appendices in. They won't get looked at if they're not relevant. And as I said, net from next year, we'll, we'll be dropping the appendices. So it's a good habit to try not to include them, include them now. OK, so this application of context is really important. Um, you'll pick an organisation, as I said at the beginning. But if you look at the questions before you pick that organisation, you'll get the best chance at applying um, your knowledge to that example of your organisation. So you would look at the theory that you need to look at around each question, and then you think about your organization and give examples of when answering the question of how it's relevant to that particular organization. By applying context, that's where you pick up more marks because the qualifications that you said are about not only you understand in business theory, but also showing that you've got a level of application by picking a, an organization and applying your answers to that organization. So it's really important um, that that happens um, and, that, and that you show that in your answer. I've briefly mentioned theory dumping. What we mean by theory dumping is that you might read up, um, say learning outcome one in the study guide, and there's a whole load of theories in there. Um, and you've got them in your head. And then a question asked you about um, potentially evaluating the importance of X theory um, within your organization. And what you then proceed to do is just tell us all about the theory. So look at the question. We're not asking you to tell us and repeat the theory. We're asking you to evaluate the usefulness of a theory. So really, really look at the question and, and avoid just telling us what you know about a theory. If the question asks you to, you know, describe or explain X theory, then of course you have to describe or explain X theory. But most of the questions talk about is a theory relevant to and, and used in your organization. So it's about talking about how it's used. So we don't need you to tell us in that instance all about the theory. We just need you to tell us about how you apply it and how it's used. So again, it's about looking at the question and looking at the words in the question. So the command words and the detail of the question to, to ensure that you answer it correctly and don't just say, see, the 14 principles of management and start telling us about them unless we've asked you describe the 14 principles of management if we haven't said that then don't think you need to describe it to answer the question it's about you understanding the theory and then applying it to answer the question okay so there, there, there's some top tips and they're things that every window our markers see happening and, and just want us to remind students not to fall into that trap unless obviously the question specifically asks them to explain or describe a theory. OK, we've talked about this quite a bit already, so taking notice of the command word. So I will share these slides um, with centres and they will get shared after this session. And there's some links to our command word documents. These are all on the website as well and can be found on the portal. But this is really worth keeping open when you're putting your, um, your assignments or your open book exams together. It's a really good idea to have this document to hand because as you get the question, you can go back into this document and think, do I, do I understand that command word? So if the command word is evaluate, what's the expectation? What type of answer would I be giving? What, what's, you know, what's expected? What does that mean? And this document really guides you and gives you some examples to, to how questions should be answered um, with the use of different command words. So it's a really, really useful document and one that we say you should use every time you're, you're starting to write up your assignments or your open book exams. OK, at this point, I'm going to be quiet um, and I'm going to hand over to Simon. And Simon, if you if you just want to say next slide when you're ready, I will flick you on to the next slide.
Thank you, Vicky. Can everybody, can you hear me? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time, next few slides, um, talking about some very important things, particularly uh, how to increase your grade level and what makes uh, a good academic argument, followed by um, some tips for reading and uh, for evidence gathering. And then later on, um, we're going to be talking about my favourite subject, which is uh, academic malpractice. So um, starting off with uh, tips on, on increasing your grade level. Um, Vicky, yes, moving on to the next slide. So um, in each of the syllabuses that we, we publish, you'll, you'll find some what we call grade descriptors uh, in, in uh, the back of each unit um, description. And, uh, but the, here we thought we would, we would give a, a, a sort of a hierarchy of, uh, of potential grades by, by looking at um, um, content and uh, evaluating particular types of content within um, the uh, the, in, within answers that we get. So um, starting off with with you know a very a very uh, poor answer might be, and this this is looking at um, uh, answering a, a question about um, COVID nineteen, uh, the coronavirus, and and examining ways in which the uh, reasons why the um, the virus uh, expanded exponentially around the world. So uh, something which is you know, very descriptive uh, and rather poor in terms of answer is just to say, well, there was a virus, um, which, yes, we know, I, th I think would, would be uh, a marker's reaction. Um, but that's that's a, a very basic statement and is not likely to gain uh, much in the way of marks. Um, it, more in terms of uh, description, but being very descriptive to say, well, there was a pandemic caused by a virus, many people got ill uh, and died prematurely. Um, that is, is, uh, is certainly a, a description of what's happened, but doesn't really give much information about cause and effect um, or any point to any wider implications of, uh, of the virus. Um, some evaluation, which will gain sort of at the upper end of, uh, of the pass mark, uh, remembering that PASS is at 40 and uh, Merit Mark starts at 55, is a global pandemic caused by a virus called COVID-19. Um, uh, many people got sick and, and died prematurely. And a description of, of um, government agencies and NGOs, non-governmental organisations, and their reactions to it. Um, there is some evaluation, but it could go a lot further. Getting the higher end of the marks now, so we're out of a higher pass and into a merit. Uh, we talk, talk perhaps talk about things contextually. So uh, here, the risk of a global pandemic caused by a coronavirus was predicted. It's not as though coronavirus of itself is something that hasn't uh, erupted before globally. Um, those with longer memories may remember the, the SARS outbreak in 2001, for example. It's all part of the same cluster of virus families. So the risk of a global pandemic caused by coronavirus was predicted. It's, it's not something that uh, as you know, just, just uh, comes out of nowhere. Um, so the 2020 pandemic was caused by uh, COVID-19 virus, which is highly infectious. You can talk about the, the R rate, so where it is uh, above one, it becomes uh, almost, infections almost exponential, um, and then uh, analyze some of the, the reactions to this event. Th this, is, this is becoming more evaluative and shows uh, a grasp of the wider context, the history, um, and, um, and ways in which uh, public disasters of this kind can be predicted. Getting towards higher marks still, so 70% is a distinction in, a, in our mark um, uh, scheme. Uh, a dynamic global economy and high transmission rates cause the rapid spread of a highly infectious disease. Um, so this again is, is probing into the reasons as to why this particular disease um, became evidential uh, through, throughout the world. So you are actually looking at something uh, which is, if you like, a function of a global economy um, many of, of the infection rates in Europe, for example, Italy became uh, and Belgium became became uh, two of the countries where where uh, infection rates grew grew the, the quickest um, th through international travel as much as uh, as much as anything else. And then um, 
that which is going to get you higher marks still is, is to again probe the, the causes and the consequences um, and actually to make an evaluation of, of some of the solutions. So here in this example, we're, we're positing that um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the battle against coronavirus is not going to be solved by the development of vaccines. Vaccines is not, is not going to make, is not going to make this, dis this disease disappear, that there are actually um, wider implications, for example, tackling poverty, uh, funding health services, preventative measures, these, these sorts of things. So we're looking at something which is original and, and contains um, a measure of critical analysis. Again, think about the command words that um, Vicky was talking about earlier. Um, and particularly at the higher diploma levels, so at level five and level six, we know in Sri Lanka that uh, most of the centres are, are doing um, level five if, and level six uh, diplomas, that so the criti critically analyse is going to be one of the key uh, command words that you will find in some of the questions that are uh, asked in the uh, assignments and the OBEs. So that gives a, a, a sort of a framework of how um, mark distribution is uh, is generated on the basis of the sophistication of the answers that are given uh, by learners in um, assignments and OBEs. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. Seems we've encountered the odd technical problem. Uh -huh. So gathering evidence, that's the um, next task. So on to slide 15, so the next one. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we, we've, in this slide, we, we've um, summarised, uh, if you like, a hierarchy of, uh, of sources and divided the slide into two uh, columns, one on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side, uh, to give learners a, a guide, really, of which types of sources to, to concentrate on and which to not exactly avoid necessarily, but which to treat with uh, a degree of scepticism. Um, so we start, first of all, with the ABE study guide. There, there's one for each unit. Um, the study guides contain a, a wealth of information uh, about the theories, the um, uh, bibliographies that are uh, uh, used in the in the construction of the uh, uh, of the units um, and should be used as a springboard for debates for for analyzing the debates about about particular about particular subjects so start with those uh, and then move out um, to to other sources particularly those which are what we call the academic journals so whether it's their um, uh, sourced from uh, open source Google Scholar, various various other, um, or whether from the journal websites and so, because each of those journals has got websites. Um, industry magazines, so so industry sources which are published for uh, by participants within specific industries. Published research reports, um, particularly those from NGOs, the non-government organisations like the OECD, the World Bank, um, UNESCO, ver various other organisations which uh, invest a lot in producing country reports, industry reports, um, and so and so forth. Um, if you are uh, looking at a particular organisation, then your organisation will also publish, uh, particularly if they're quoted companies, then they publish uh, annual reports and accounts for investors, uh, usually most um, Joint stock companies, private, even private limited companies, have to uh, uh, submit report and accounts every, uh, annually uh, as to to fulfil uh, public information requirements and so forth, and and that's pretty standard in, in most countries around the world. And then you have the textbooks and the academic books, which are used uh, in uh, class in in classrooms, which are are focused on a particular subject, topic or subject. Ones to um, perhaps put on the on the more skeptical list 
uh, are those which are, if you like, published from, from online sources. Um, we have our favourite, which is Wikipedia. Uh, on one level, there's, there's nothing wrong with Wikipedia, um, but do remember that Wikipedia is, is, you know, can be manipulated by spe special interest groups. Um, very often you get, you get Wikipedia scams where uh, uh, famous people, particularly when they die, people go in and edit uh, those, those persons, uh, pe people's uh, profiles um, and put in you know, ludicrous statements, which it, it takes moderators some time to, uh, to remove. So the statements that are made by Wikipedia are, are, uh, sometimes have to be treated with a degree of scepticism. And also uh, publications by by other online organisations, um, Facebook, for example, is a is a good one of this. Um, be sceptical or wary of materials that that are um, are out of date. Um, research articles without sources, so it's very difficult to know how what the assertion what the uh, uh, the basis is of the of the assertions or the findings or the conclusions that are in a report with no sources. Other websites um, and personal opinions uh, not backed up by hard data I think is uh, is going to be going to be on on uh, on that right hand list um, next slide please Vicky so think about how reliable your source is so uh, think about what the qualifications are of the author are they uh, practicing academics are they professors uh, are they industry experts have they been in the business for you know 10 20 30 years you know that's going to to, to lend a, a degree of um, uh, reassurance um, based on qualifications. Uh, are the sources listed? Does it have a reference list or the bibliography at the back? Um, and have a look at the types of uh, um, articles and, and books that are, are references that are being cited to, to give a, an idea of the spread of uh, information that the, uh, that the author has used. Um, is the article or journal, is it uh, peer reviewed? So um, the mainstay academic reviews, say like the Harvard Business Review, um, those articles are what we call peer reviewed. So prior, after submission, um, it will be sent by editors to, to readers um, who will make comments um, which are relayed back to the author. Um, so it, it's, uh, it, it's a, a, a way of um, giving a kite mark, as it were, to, to, to work which, um, uh, which is going to be put into the public domain. Um, is the writing objective? Does, does the writer have a particular agenda which is not supported by the, um, uh, by, by the evidence? Is it, is it a series of assertions rather than um, a series of conclusions drawn, drawn from evidence? Um, what's the purpose of the source? So again, you, you have to, th to look at the source and think, um, uh, see whether the, the sources are balanced and think about when, when it was published. Um, we did say in the earliest previous slide to, to be wary of sources where, where it's, it's uh, sort of out of date, as it were, you might say in inverted commas, but some seminal texts and some um, management tools have actually been around for a very long time. Uh, it's worth remembering that the father of economics, Adam Smith, was a man who died in the 18th century, and yet his wealth of nations, and in particular his um, analysis of the division of labour, is still uh, one, of, one of the seminal uh, e economic texts uh, that, that, is, that is used even to this day. Um, we did a presentation to um, uh, Malawi yesterday where uh, we were noting that um, in project management, one of the key um, project management tools is something called a Gantt chart. Um, Andrew Gantt uh, was an American um, sociologist and he invented this, Gantt, uh, this particular management tool in 1911, so 110 years ago. So it's the, the, um, uh, the, the age and the provenance of, uh, of, of management tools and, and, and academic writing is not necessarily uh, disqualified by age, but, um, but it's worth remembering that the context and the techniques that uh, have evolved over the last uh, 10, 20 years um, can, will, will change the, um, the applicability of, of some, uh, some conclusions and some data. Um, for example, Hofstede's 
uh, analysis of the um, of, of cultural aspects of organizational change was written as a as a critique of the IBM studies take, taking place in the in the 1960s so which is actually still because of the wealth of the data that was used and generated something in the region of a quarter of a million um, data points um, from specific individuals around I think seven different IBM territories you know it's still it's still a, a source which is mined but you know the attitudes and uh, the presumptions uh, surrounding the, of that data set obviously because it was done in the 60s um, has, uh, has changed has changed immeasurably next uh, yes so again reading for evidence I think one one of the key things that uh, you know that you need to to focus on or learners can focus on is is where you will find sources of, of evidence quickly um, and when you're writing a, a, a critique of uh, of particular texts or theories then um, as Vicky says don't, don't describe necessarily what the what the theory says but but uh, focus on on those aspects of the uh, of, of a theory or framework which is um, which are, which are likely to to be illuminating as to use it as a framework for analysis of the data that's been supported which is supporting and coming from your chosen organization so uh, again I, I interrogate the sources and say you know what's the main purpose of study um what what what's the uh, the goal that the academic has set in order to uh, um uh, to to discover the the conclusions um what key questions is the or the author is the author addressing um what is the most important information what's the data source uh what are the main inferences and conclusions and are they supported by the evidence that uh, that has been adduced and if we take the line of reasoning series, what, what seriously, then what are the implications? What consequences are likely to follow if people take the author's re reasoning and apply them in, in, a, in a variety of situations? So be alert to, um, if you like, the context of theory or uh, academic journals, and also um, be aware of the motivation of the, uh, of the writers and what they are um, the, what what they're intending to uh, to show, and then have a think about whether or not the evidence that the writer has produced does actually support the arguments that uh, that are being placed upon them. Next slide, please. Now, this is a, this is a key one, and it relates to and it and it and it goes into um, uh, a slides which we'll be um, looking at a little bit further down, which will relate to academic malpractice. Uh, one of the key things I think that learners should try to avoid um, is simply, uh, particularly in using online sources of uh, what, of just doing a sort of a copy and paste. Um, I see, a, you see a nice little summary online on 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 a website, and you think, oh yes, that summarizes everything about X Y Z theory, and it really answers the question that uh, that has been posed in my assignment or or the or the OBE, and you copy and paste it, and you and um, uh, it uh, and, and it looks very neat and tidy. However, um, that all that demonstrates is your ability to be able to manipulate um, uh, an internet source and put it into a document. Um, so, don't quote, uh, don't um, whole scale copy, synthesize. Show that you have some understand. You have an understanding of the uh, of the theory and particularly the frameworks and how they relate to the company that you have chosen, um, so that you can demonstrate that it's your work. Um, so so um, support the work with statement by incorporating ideas of your own by saying, yes, uh, this theoretician says this, but on the other hand, if you look at my company, this, uh, this doesn't necessarily apply. Um, so it shows that you're uh, alert to the insights that a theory might um, uh, provide, but on the other hand, you're, you're showing that uh, the data um, evidence that, that you, can, you can bring to bear on, on the question actually shows, shows it up in a, in a particular, in a different the theory up in a different light. So, and that's, that's come through your understanding and, and, your, uh, uh, and also the wider reading. So synthesis is really important in, um, in acad as a feature of academic writing. Next. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so academic this segues very nicely into avoiding academic malpractice. Academic malpractice um, consists basically of three things. So one is is plagiarism. Uh, the second is collusion, and we'll come on to that. And then there's uh, what in in our language we talk about as uh, poor academic practice. But we'll look at each one of these in turn. Um, so don't copy somebody else's work. Um, so, yep, yep, stay on that slide, thank you. Um, make sure you correctly cite and reference the sources within in the work. Um, and, and when in doubt, you know, do you, there, there comes a point where, you know, if you're discussing a theory in each in each point to, to, to give a reference, you know, to every line, to every page may seem a little bit like overkill, but, but there are times, every time you make an assertion, you know, that, that something applies, then, then make sure that you've got uh, a, uh, um, a evidence, particularly if it comes from, from somebody at somebody else's work to make sure that it's, uh, uh, that it's properly referenced. Um, because what we want to read is your voice, not not the voice of other people's. You you can you can create a, a, a perfectly workable assignment on on the basis of other people's work, and that's not really the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is to is to show that you have uh, a view, a reference view on how to answer a particular question that takes into account evidence that you have you have created and collated, and that you can demonstrate your understanding of how the theory the theory. Uh, uh, can act as a framework to 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 illuminate that and to 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 analyze the the data that you have um, that you've created so um, uh, in terms of the the uh, referencing we adopt the uh, Harvard reference system there is uh, a link on I think in this presentation to um, uh, to, to to how we to how we reference and particularly here so you give the author's surname and the date and the page numbers uh, and the the, um, the publication location if that's uh, if that's listed. Next slide. So collusion. Collusion um, is where two or more people get together um, to take to either share a common framework for answering a question, but more specifically, usually by um, taking a third the, the work of a third party and passing it off as their own. Um, so uh, we we see many examples of this from learners from two or more learners with answering a particular unit assignment or uh, OBE, where uh, it's quite clear that they've identified um, uh, a single source and they both copied from it almost word for word, thinking that they can disguise this by changing the company name um, and the, through the company summary. Unfortunately, leaving everything else intact, uh, just changing the company name as they go through in a, in a search and replace function. Unfortunately, the, the, we, run, we use Turnitin, uh, a, a plagiarism software, which uh, I'm sure you, you're familiar with, um, which uh, identifies this not only uh, that two or more learners have copied off a, a, a common source, but if that common source is another ABE student, it will identify that that ABE student as well. So, do take care not to not to collude because th this actually will will be uh, you'll be found out um, much much quicker uh, than than with the uh, uh, the, the plagiarism. Um, uh, example that we talked about earlier. So uh, make sure that uh, you keep the integrity of your work uh, intact. So don't let others read your work. Uh, don't give and particularly don't sell someone your answer if you've already done it and got a high score. Uh, and don't do the work for somebody else. Next slide. Yeah. And then there's this one, um, which is poor academic practice. When we use Turnitin, um, we have for each level a, uh, a set of criteria by which we judge um, a piece of work. It's also worth noting, and I'll, and I'll reinforce this, that um, uh, you may well present, if you're a learner, present your work uh, in good faith, uh, having no intention to cheat, but have just been careless. Uh, unfortunately, if you have, uh, as I said earlier, you know, taken uh, whole scale pieces, blocks of text 
um, from particular internet sources, many of which incidentally are actually designed precisely for this purpose without either A, attribution or B, changing very much of it, um, you will get what they call a very high match score percentage. And the higher the match score percentage in plagiarism cases, the, the greater at risk you are of your work being deemed as uh, as being plagiarist, whether you have that intention or not. So um, uh, we, we work from the basis that if you have a high match score, uh, your, your carelessness um, is, is not an excuse. So um, those pieces of work which are at the borderline of the, the turn it in levels at each uh, at, at each stage um, at each level um, may fall into what we call the poor academic practice so if they're on the cusp uh, if the top five sources uh, account for you know more than 60 70 percent of the, of the total match score up to the allowable amount then um, then it is very probable that your work will be deemed poor academic practice uh, particularly if it's poorly referenced and um, will be capped at, at a pass for uh, the unit which is 40 even though academically it may be assessed at a higher at a higher level so you run um, the risk of of, uh, of having the, the work capped as, uh, as, a, as as a fail at a pass if you see what I mean um, that that's how we how we uh, classify that so do what you can in order to uh, to avoid that so thank you for listening and uh, I will now hand over back to uh, back to Vicky thanks Simon Okay, um, so that that's kind of the the overview of uh, or the reminder, if you like, on how to um, prepare for your assignments in your your open book exams. We're just going to summarise what what we've been through and um, and highlight the key points um, from that session. And we haven't mentioned yet the ABE way, but I think everything that Simon and I have been talking about um, is is born out of a, a set of principles that we follow at ABE. Um, and the ABE way is something that's been developed um, because of uh, our students and our centres um, and the way that, generally speaking, um, students and centres conduct themselves. And, and one of the key principles is acting with integrity. So I think everything that, that we've tried to do today in this session is to help students and centres um, embed integrity into everything that they do. So Simon's... Um, uh, advice then around ma academic malpractice is really just to highlight to, to students and centres how, how easy it is to fall into that and not necessarily knowingly fall into it. So, so hopefully that, that guidance that Simon's given will, will help everybody sort of uh, achieve, achieve their goals and, and act with integrity along the way um, and, and be part of the ABE community and the way that we do things. Um, in order to, to achieve your, your overall goal of your qualifications. So that's, that's one reminder. Um, answering the questions and responding to command words, I think is one of the key things that we've said during this session. Um, a question came in on, on, on Facebook to say, but shouldn't we just give a definition of a theory as a kind of pre-run to answering a question? And, and my answer to that would be, unless you've been asked to explain or describe a particular theory, if you're asked to um, refer to, say, Porter's Five Forces in, in an answer, um, look at the command word of how it's asking you to respond to that. So is the application of that theory um, useful in the context of your given organization, you wouldn't then need to give a de definition of the theory before you answer the question because it's asking you, is that theory relevant to your organization or how is it used maybe? So you wouldn't have to describe the theory then say how it's used, it's asking you to talk about the relevance of it in relation to the organization. So look at the command word and that will determine whether or not a description or a definition is required but I'd say for level five and above it probably wouldn't be a command word that would be um, and then you'd also need to look at the explain and describe and the rest of the question to determine whether or not a definition is required most of the time it isn't our academic team are marking these they know the theories they don't need a reminder of a theory unless the question is outline the such and such theory 
or explain it, then yeah, a definition of it and an explanation of it would be completely fine. Um, keep to the point and avoid waffling. So if you're not too sure when you're answering a question, it's open book. So go back and do a bit more research. Um, for this session, you've got the guide to lost learning. So you've got a little bit more detail around the specific assessment criteria that should help you determine where you do that particular research. Um, right at the very beginning, we talked about word count and sticking with a word count. So if you can write your assignments in a word document, check the word count. Then when you're happy, you've got your final submission, save it as a PDF and then submit it. Then you know you haven't gone over the word count. Look at the marks per question. They'll give you an indicator of how many words you should be using. So if you've got 3,000 overall in an assignment and one of the questions is 30 marks, you're going to know that that's a big percentage of your word count that you're going to use in answering that question. Um, quality and quantity of references as well is a key thing. Um, Simon's kind of gone over. Um, we use the Harvard reference method and there is a document that you can use to um, help guide you um, through the referencing part. Allow enough time for referencing. So don't take your, your research and your writing of your assignment right up to the wire, up to the day of submission. Because it can take quite a bit of time to do. Um, so I would say leave enough time. Don't rush your referencing. Don't leave an hour before submission and you've still got all your referencing to do. Allow enough time to do quality referencing. Um, synthesizing materials to demonstrate your understanding. So as Simon said, you know, you've got a quote in there. Talk about how that quote is relevant to answering the question and relevant to your organization and, and whether or not you know, you agree with the person that has said this or not and what evidence you have in, in whether you agree or not. So it's synthesizing answers and materials. Um, it's here, it's answered the what and the why. The what is important, okay? So, so look, at, look at how everything relates, that links to the sort of synthesis answer and make sure that you are answering the question and you are giving enough of your own voice that's coming through. And lastly, and this is really important, Simon's given some really good advice on how to avoid academic malpractice, and that could be plagiarism, collusion, or just a, a cap at a pass at poor academic malpractice. You know, if you're caught for plagiarism or collusion, and the percentage of the work in your assignment or your open book exam is showing that it's not your own, it's say full of cutting and pasting and quotes and no synthesis, then you will find that you'll get a one mark, which shows that you failed due to academic malpractice. So you wanna avoid that um, at all costs if you can. Okay, there's some useful links um, uh, here. We've got the command word link. I've also put a link back to Carrie Foster's original um, session that she did, which was the guide to writing a great assignment, an OBE. Um, and that's broken down into bite-sized chunks on YouTube. So if you wanted to just go back over her, her part on command words, because you're still struggling with that, just click on the section for command words and watch that back. Um, it's a really, really useful session. Um, we've also got details around all of the ABE way and all of the principles that we're working towards. There's some great study tips um, and obviously the links to command words on the website, on the on the student page, you will find links to all of this um, as well. And a lot of the documents are also featured on the portal as well. So you should be you should be um, you should be able to find all this stuff. If you can't, um, then uh, contact your centre. Your centre should have all of this and have downloaded this anyway. OK. And then lastly, um, we've just really got to the question section. So I've answered one that was on um, Facebook that came through. I'm just gonna check my other stream. There aren't any more there. Um, okay, so we've got a few more. How many references um, are we to do for level six? Okay, so in terms of references, there aren't a set number. Um, it's about the synthesis that Simon talked about. So if you're preparing your argument or answering a particular question, it's about 
the relevance of a reference. So a reference or a referring to a piece of text or a source is used to support your answer. So we would never say you need to per answer give four, five or six. It's just the relevance of those references for you to be able to answer the question. Um, so there isn't really a guide on that. Um, but if you if you kind of go back through the session that that, that Carrie did last year that we've we've put the link to, um, you'll be able to see examples of referencing and when it's relevant and how to put relevant referencing in because there's a whole detailed section on that. So, so it isn't really about numbers, it's about um, the, the relevance of it. Then it says, can we use colour in our tables? You can use colour in tables, but what I would ask you to think about is, is that table relevant? Does that table need to be inserted as part of your answer? Um, and, and is it just taking up space? So, so yeah, colours can be used, um, but it's are they relevant and are the tables relevant? So only include what's absolutely necessary to answer to answer the question. Just going to go to the chat and have a look in the chat to see if there's any further questions. Um, OK. OK, so one question is that some students received a one mark in their um, in their exam under which. Uh, OK, so that we've answered. A one mark means that academic malpractice is in place. OK, so yeah, so if a student got a one mark, that means academic malpractice took place. So they didn't pass the plagiarism and collusion tests in, um, in Turnitin. OK. Vicky, can I can I just add that if anybody is uncertain about about um, uh, the zero or one allocation marks, there is a uh, marks uh, explanation policy on the website. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you look in the policies section of the website, the link to that is in the footer on the main page, uh, the home page. Um, you you'll see uh, a policy which out outlines why um, uh, the the rationale for uh, awarding particular marks. OK, and then we've got another question about how to reference a journal that's on a website. So I guess it's whether or not you you access that journal and you reference that journal, then you would reference the journal um, or whether or not it's a, a particular website. So in our referencing document, there's details of how to reference both. Um, so I would just urge you again, like the command words document, to have the referencing document open um, so that it can show you how to reference in the assignment and then how to do the reference section at the end. Um, OK, I think that is all of the all of the questions there at the end. You can still submit questions um, to us if you if you think of any after after this session, they can either be via your centre and then they can contact us if they collect all of the all of the questions in um, your your regional um, business director or business manager can also filter questions in um, info at you can send questions in via that and they'll filter their way through to product or the product email. Um, so there's several ways that you can do it. Um, if you've got if you've got any questions following um, this session, it has been recorded so you can watch the session back um, and, and the slides will be supplied um, as well. So you can see those useful links that are in there. Um, and there, as I said, there's a lot more detail in Carrie Foster's full um, version uh, of this webinar um, that we've acknowledged at the bottom there. She's one of our chief examiners. Um, and there's there's much greater detail on command words referencing in, in that in those YouTube videos that should help you prepare for the up and coming session. Um, I'm just checking there's one more in the chat that's come up. No, I think they have all been um, they've all been answered. OK. Oh. OK, hang on. There's another question coming through. OK, about the zero grade. OK, so um, you would get a zero mark 
if you didn't include an organizational summary. So if you're a new student and you've never done an assessment before, um, I, I would advise you to um, contact your tutor and, and have a conversation with your tutor before you start preparing. But when you look at an assignment or an open book exam, there'll be a front cover with a page of instructions. Read that really, really carefully. And for both open book exams and assignments, you need to pick an organization and you need to do a summary of that organization. Um, and there's a space for that. And it's 200 words you need to complete. And there's, a, there's guidance on the things you need to include in that organizational summary. If you fail to include an organizational summary, then your work doesn't get marked and you receive a zero mark, so you fail. So the reason for the organizational summary is because when you answer the questions in the assignment or the open book exam, we want you to relate them to your organization. So we need to know what your organization is um, that you've chosen so that we can see how you relate your answers to that organization. And as I said, if you look at the questions, that might help guide you as to the size organization you pick. We would encourage you to pick one in country so that you can access materials around that organization. But sometimes you might wanna pick a larger organization depending on the questions that are asked, or you might wanna pick a more medium sized organization. The key thing is, is that you can access information about that organization. Um, in order to answer the questions. So hopefully um, that answers the zero mark question that we've had. Um, okay, well, we've just gone slightly over time. So I think that's, um, that's us calling time on this, on this webinar. We hope it's been really, really useful um, to you. And as we've said, you can follow up with questions via um, various routes after this session. I'd um, just like to thank everybody for turning up. We've had record numbers in the Zoom. We had at one point 100 people in the Zoom, and I'm sure we've had um, equal numbers um, watching us uh, on our Facebook live stream. So thank you to everybody for attending and um, good luck from all of us at ABE with the up and coming assessment window. Um, we, we wish you every success um, and we'll see you at some point in the future. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.